Hi, my name is David Keegan. I'm an academic family doctor here at the University of Calgary. What we're talking about now is how to document an admission history and physical part two. So in the earlier video, and the URL is here, we talked about how do you document the, uh, the history part of it. Now we're talking about the remainder, the physical, the assessment, and the plan. Okay, so we already talked about the importance of clarity and accuracy, and this holds true for the physical exam part as well. So usually what's good to do is give at least a space of line between the, the history and then the physical, and then the physical, so it's the on exam. And you can write on exam or OE, it's pretty obvious, or you can write phys for physical. Uh, it could also be O for objective. So if it's an admission history and physical or another major write-up, such as you're doing a consult at the bedside in the ICU or you're doing a post-op consult, some sort of massive you know, assessment that's detailed, vitals are going to be important. They're called that because they are vital. So your vitals, you're going to want to flag. So heart rate, BP, rest brace, and O2 sat, and temp. And so O2SAT, I guess, is not one of the, f there were four classic vitals, but O2SAT is a really critical other one to just include here as well. Now again, if this is an inpatient or you're admitting from a merge kind of thing, it's good to just not give the numbers. It's good to really tease apart if there's any detail that you need. So you'll, you'll notice that I keep saying the details are important. So if say somebody's got a heart rate of like, you know, 82, and their blood pressure is 90 over 60, and the respiratory rate is 28, their O2 sat is 96%, and their temperature is uh, 37.5. You know, no matter what condition they have, yeah, they're breathing a bit fast if they're an adult, but this doesn't look that bad. But what if the only reason they're, they've got a heart rate of 82 is because they are on inotropes? And same, that's the, the only reason that they're on the blood pressure, that they've got a decent blood pressure, is because they're on ionotropes. Or maybe, maybe the heart rate is that good because they're paced. They've got a pacemaker, an external, or now they've got an internal uh, emergency pacemaker or something. And what if the respiratory rate and O2SAT are only 96% because they're on four liters of oxygen via nasal prong, or they're on a fractured fraction of inspired oxygen of 100% through a, a non-rebreather mask. I mean, these things are critical context. So what I would recommend you do, sorry, grabbing the eraser, my apologies, is that get into the habit. In fact, I'm, I haven't done emergency medicine in uh, eight years now. As I was writing this, I still had trouble for the video's sake suppressing not doing it this way. So the vitals, so I might say like heart rate 82 uh, and then blood pressure 90 over 60, no inotropes. Now, if somebody's in for an ankle sprain, you probably don't have to get into that, the, the, the lack of inotropes. But if they're sick in any other way, uh, systemically ill, and particularly, and, I, and frankly, absolutely, if they're in the ICU, you will always make that very clear, who's on anotropes, who isn't. And the respiratory rate of 28 and an O2 sat of 96%, either you might say on room air, or you could even write it out on room air, or on FiO2 of 100%, or maybe they're actually on a ventilator, you know, ventilated, and you could write the, the settings. And so these things are so dependent upon these other contexts that it's important to say for anybody who's got any hint of systemic disease. And of course, you, you can put your temperature in there too. Great. Next. General. So it's good to give a general overview. What you're actually seeing. And this... NAD is bad. Make it a professional decision to never use no acute distress or no apparent distress or NAD. What's bad about it is that it's, 
You don't know. I remember seeing a case report published where they were talking about a psychotic patient and they put in general NAD. And yet the description later on, the patient was like throwing chairs around the room. Clearly the patient was distressed. It was just a habit that I guess people get into. NAD, NAD. No, instead, what you should do is for every patient, write what they look like. So if this is a child who's uh, uh, in because they're not drinking well, write what you see before you go into the bedside, look across the room, and then you know, what do you see? And you might say, so it's a uh, uh, child happily playing with blocks. And if you write that, you know that child is not probably horribly ill. Or if instead the general description, because what you saw was child uh, laying quietly on side, listless, doesn't mind when blood drawn. Either this is the most incredibly stoic five-year-old kid ever, or more likely, this child is horribly ill. In fact, this is pretty much the definition of medical lethargy. When a child is so sick, they don't care when you stab them with a sharp metal object. Writing that is critical, so people know what the child or the person in front of you look like. Now, if they were febrile when they came in and they got some, uh, some antipyretics, maybe their temperature comes down and then they start looking well, great, or whatever, and you can always update things and so on. Uh, but getting that general description is going to be really important. And from then on, you just go down through the systems. So you can do it different ways. I have to say, most of my colleagues say it's easiest to just go from the head down. So the head and neck exam, uh, so the respiratory exam, cardiovascular exam, and so on, all the way down. And then like CNS exam is sort of separate from head and neck, so you would include cranial nerves, say here. You would include you know, power, tone, sensation, all those other things here as well. And try to keep everything lined up nicely, get some nice headings to make it all clear, and you put down all your physical findings in the appropriate sections. Great, and then at the very bottom, <clears throat> underneath your physical exam, you're gonna have your, your assessment. So it might be like, <clears throat> what do you think is going on? Uh, so right middle lobe pneumonia. <clears throat> and I'm sorry, but just before the assessment, if you have any findings, any investigations, you would include them here. So you might have some blood work that might be there. You might have some x-ray. Uh, so you may have an x-ray report and so on. Any investigations would be there. And then your assessment, your diagnosis, what's going on. If you're not sure, you know, you can always put, if you need to, you know, query pneumonia, if you're not sure. And sometimes people might have a, di uh, like a symptom, but you don't know what it is. So it could be like hypotension, NYD, and you just don't know, or chest pain, NYD. And then your plan, now your plan here is not your detailed orders. This is just your like, you're gonna admit, let's say you're gonna treat, treat for pneumonia. Uh, O2 until no longer dependent, because maybe this is a hypoxic child, which is triggering the emission because their O2 sats are too low. And you sort of give the overall flavor of where, what's going on with this patient. So again, you be clear and accurate. When there's any sort of question about what's going on with this patient on physical exam or whatever, just you know, look at them more. If there's any question on investigations and there's things that you're not yet clear on, you can actually even add in any future plans that you still need to clarify. You're seeking some degree of certainty about these things 
so that you and others can provide good care for the patient. So if there's any future plans, like maybe uh, a weight, maybe they're gonna get in hospital, pulmonary function test for whatever reason, or whatever, or weight cultures, uh, weight blood culture report, whatever. So you can put some pending tests and so on in general. So be clear, be accurate, lay out your note in a way so that other people can easily find the information about this patient and put things in a nice clear format and then you're going to be a star for both patient care and also demonstrating your clinical ability because you're able to record and document it in such a good fashion. Thanks very much.